I'm, I'm very excited. We're going to be continuing on the, on the topic of the Holy Spirit today. Now, just so you all know, I, I know you, you're probably like, man, well, where's the Father's Day message? I know. I like to teach on what God tells us to teach. We celebrate the fathers, but, but God said, Holy Spirit. I said, yes, sir. Holy Spirit. So we're going to continue on this. And you know what? We've been having such a good time with this. If you missed last week's message, Pastor Jared, it was an amazing message. You guys go on YouTube and listen to it. Talking about the nature of God as explained through the different symbolism, through the, through the scriptures. We're having a, a good time with this. And we're going to stay on it for a while. I was planning on ending next week, but we're going to keep going. We're just going to keep going. The, 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 the Holy Spirit and our interaction with him is so important during this time. As a matter of fact, it is of the utmost importance. The Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Spirit, and that is who we have, and that is how we interact with God now. So it is of the utmost importance that we understand how God operates within the church and within our lives right now. As I discussed when we, when we started this series, we, we, we have to move on from the different levels that God brings us through in our development in him. See, we got to know God the Father. He's the creator. Remember, he's the initiator. We got to know God the Son through Jesus Christ who gave his life for us and died for our sins. But Jesus went to the Father. He's no longer here. So while we come to God through the cross, we don't stay at the cross. We move past the cross and we receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what the disciples had to do. They had to watch Jesus ascend into heaven, then go to Jerusalem and wait to receive the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that is moving and operating in this time. You're like, well, is there three different people? No, it's all one. It's all one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it's all, they are all one. It is, they are God. It's kind of weird trying to explain the Trinity, but think of it like this. I am Jesse. Here's my head. Here's my hands. Here's my feet. So... Which part of me just walked over here? All of me. Which part of me did the work, though? My feet. Who just picked up the Bible? Was it Jesse's hand or Jesse? Both. Because my hand picked it up, right? And then who gave the instruction to do it? The head, but it all works together. Same thing with God. The Holy Spirit is the extension of God that is working now. And if we don't get this down, we're going to be frustrated as Christians because we're going to be missing out on something that we know is supposed to be there. So that's why we're taking time with this topic over the next few weeks and the past few weeks. So let's pray as we get into the word today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for being present here with us. Lord, we just thank you that it is your desire that we would draw closer to you, Lord God. So as we draw close to you today, Father, draw close to us. We want to know you in a deeper way. We want to experience you in a new way today, Father. We don't want to walk out of here the same, Lord God. So change us and mold us today. Grant us revelation today, Lord God. As we open up your word, would you reveal truth to us, Lord God, and help us to receive truth, Lord God, so that we can be transformed and go out into this world and fulfill the purpose that you've called us to, Father. Father, we open up our hearts and our minds to receive right now. And Lord, I offer myself as a vessel for you. I ask that you would speak through me today. Fill me to overflowing, Lord God, and let every word that proceeds out of my mouth be directed directly by you, Father. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, uh, as I was preparing the message for this week, I was thinking about, you know, how we're talking about the Holy Spirit and everything, and I was like, man, this is, this is actually kind of weird if you think about it. I'm up here talking about somebody so that you guys can get to know them. Be kind of weird, huh? Like, Kurt, come here. So if, if, if me and Kurt are standing here, it's, uh, I almost felt like, you know, like back in the day, you know, BC, when y'all in the club, and you got your wingman, like, hey, man, look at that girl over there. Yeah, you want you? No, I never did this, y'all, so I'm just making this up based on what movies I've seen. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, you're, you're in there, and you're like, oh, man, look at that girl over there. You're like, yeah, go, go tell her I want to talk to her. So you go over there and talk, and you're standing there like this. Oh, Jante. 
and you have like somebody making an introduction for you and everything. I was like, what was up with that? Why don't you just walk up and say, hey, how you doing, girl? How you doing? It doesn't make sense to me. So I, I felt a little weird. Thanks, Kurt. Like, I'm like God's wingman here, trying to come up to y'all and be like, hey, look, there's this God over here who's incredible. I mean, check him out over there. He's really nice. You got to get to know him and everything. He's going to come over in a minute, ask for your number. You know, just be cool with him and everything. <laughs> God's already got your number. He knows you. He loves you. So as I'm, as I'm here kind of instructing you uh, about him, I want you to know that first and foremost, God wants to talk to you personally. You don't need me to have God talk to you. Amen. As a matter of fact, that is the least thing that God wants is for you to rely on someone like me to tell you about him. He wants you to experience him. Why just sit here and listen to me talk about him when you can go and talk directly to him? But I'm encouraging you because a lot of people don't know that that's something that you can do. That you can actually speak to God and he will talk to you and you can have a personal one-on-one -on -one intimate relationship with him. That's what he desires. The whole purpose of Jesus coming here was so that you could have a personal relationship with God. So that you could be loved by him and love him in return and know him. Not just through me or through someone else or through anything. It's that you would know him. You would talk to him. So I want to I talk to you today about God's working, how the Holy Spirit works, because he, he, he works in us before he works through us. You know, when we, when we get really excited about the things of God, we can, all, we, we can be about the hype. You know, nothing wrong with hype, but when you get a little too much hype, you lose the substance of, of, of a thing. So, you know, everybody wants to, you know, the, the big, you know, hoorah and all that and, and make everything look pretty. But, but what about the, the, the very substance, the internal workings of, of God? Everybody wants the, the, the gifts of the Spirit. Oh, you know, I can, I can prophesy and see the future. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, well, I, I, can, I can heal people. Awesome. Praise God. But what about the internal workings? What about what he's doing in you? And that is what he does first. We talked a couple weeks ago about how character development is one of the first things that the Holy Spirit does. He wants to develop your character. That is an internal working of the Holy Spirit. And that happens before all the external stuff happens. Amen? So I want to give you eight inner workings that the Holy Spirit does in our life. Eight things that are his responsibility that he does in you personally, in ways that you can experience him personally. So turn to John chapter 16. Book of John chapter 16. We're just going to go through these because I want you all to, to get this and, and to get the scriptures and begin meditating on what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. Sometimes it's good to, to reflect on these because we can forget about what he's, what he's doing. We can be so looking so far ahead of what could be and what he wants to do externally that we forget about the internal workings and we can miss out on everything. So we don't want to miss God. And also, I'm going to be honest, as we go through this, sometimes we can try and be uh, uh, so spiritual that we're trying to do the Holy Spirit's job. We're trying to take his job from him, but it's, but it's what he's supposed to do, and we're trying to jump in because we're really excited about God, and sometimes we can step into a realm that's not really our place, it's really the Holy Spirit's place, and that's true of this first one here. In John chapter 16, and let's take a look at verse, let's start at verse 5. It says, but now I go away to, this is Jesus speaking, he says, but now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you, the helper, the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, and when he has come, he will, listen, convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict. The Holy Spirit brings conviction. He's the one that comes in and says, uh, that's not exactly what you're supposed to be doing. He reveals that. But a lot of times, we take it upon ourselves to bring conviction to people. And this is one of the things that, that, that Christians are under the gun for, is we're always trying to convict everybody. 
well, you shouldn't be doing that, and you shouldn't be doing this, and you shouldn't. And they're like, whoa, that's not your job. Now, we do it because we know it's right, but sometimes we, we get a little too hard on people, and we got to watch that. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction. We don't have to try and force conviction on anybody. You're bad. If you do that, you're evil. What is the point? Is that someone's going to like, wow, you're right. I'm evil. I need to learn. No. God does the work. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't speak truth. But we speak the truth in love. When God tells us to, you don't need to go around and tell everybody what's wrong with them. And I, I hope this is bringing some, some stress relief. It is not your job. You don't have to do that. If you do have to talk to somebody about something that they're doing wrong and they don't change, sometimes they're like, well, well you didn't listen to me? You didn't change? Well, I'm going to pour it on even thicker. And I'm going to tell you even stronger. It's like, no. Just give them the truth and then walk away because the Holy Spirit brings conviction. There's nothing more powerful. How many of y'all have experienced this? When all of a sudden something hits your heart and you're like, that's not exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And you know it, and it's internal, and no one told you. And it's like, ah, all right, God, give me the strength. Give me the ability to do it. Pay no attention to the servant up here cleaning up the water, says the great and powerful Oz. But it's the Holy Spirit's job to bring conviction to people. You don't have to do that. So you can just receive peace. Like, man, I don't have to make someone feel bad about what they did. <laughs> no, you don't. You don't, I don't have to change anybody? No, you don't. You just be you. And you love people the way God tells you to and fulfill that role. Because it's the Holy Spirit that convicts. Say, the Holy Spirit convicts. Holy Spirit. Not me. Not me. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're not the convictor. Not the now, husbands and wives, be careful. <laughs> be very careful. You're not the convictor. <laughs> and when you go home... Please do not ever say, Pastor Jesse said. <laughs> Don't bring me into your intense discussions at home. <laughs> the Holy Spirit brings conviction. But it's such, a, it's such a wonderful thing when the Holy Spirit does it. Because it's not someone condemned you. It's not because someone made you do it. It's it, God himself spoke to your heart. You're like, I have to change this. And it's so peaceful. And sometimes it does come through someone, someone bringing a revelation to you. But when, when it hits, it's, it, it's never a change because someone told you. If you ever change because somebody told you to change, it's not a strong change. It's not. When it's an internal conviction, that's when it changes. Because convict doesn't just mean that you feel bad about something. It means that you feel strong about something too. See, when, when, when I got saved, I had a very foul mouth. My brothers and sisters didn't know all this because I saved it for the basketball court at school. So when I was playing basketball, I'd be at home, I'd be like, hello mother, hello father, lovely sister, little brother. And then on basketball, I'm like, yeah, blankly blank, you nothing. I'm going to come down the court and I'm going to bash on you. And da 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 blank, 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 blank. And I'm cussing all over the place. When I really got saved, <laughs> when the Holy Spirit came and talked to me, I heard that word come out of my mouth one time and I was like, bleh. What? That, it, it just did not feel right coming out of my mouth anymore. Right. And, he, and he began to change me. You know, some of the movies that I used to watch, I couldn't watch them anymore. I was so mad. I was like, but that was a funny movie. <laughs> but here, have you guys ever gone back and watched the movie, you know, as you've developed and grown in God? And then you watch it like, oh, I, I can't believe I ever watched this movie. <laughs> like, oh, oh, wow. Oh, my. And all of a sudden, your heart is convicted because you have a strong conviction that that's not right anymore. But it's powerful because God told you. No one told me, just stop cussing. I knew it was wrong. Nobody had to tell me, you shouldn't talk like that. Hello, I know, that's exactly why I'm doing it. I'm talking like that because it's not right, and I'm trying to get people's attention. But the Holy Spirit convicted me. It's just so much easier just to let the Holy Spirit do his work. And you can't do it for him, by the way. Anybody ever tried to bring conviction to someone and just blew up in your face? Mm-hmm. Yes. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. Number two, the second thing that he brings, he brings correction. He brings correction. 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. See, this is another thing that we, that we have to be very balanced with, is the correction that we bring to people. We do have to bring correction to people, so long as that is your position. You have to be spiritually physically, authoritatively positioned in order to bring correction to somebody. You can't just walk up to some stranger on the street and, and, and go at it and expect them to listen to you. 
Well, maybe the Lord will have you do that sometime. I'll tell you all a quick story. I was in the grocery store one time at, uh, at a Ralph's, and the children disrespecting their parents, that bothers me. That's like an automatic, <clears throat> especially when it's a, a, a mom and a single mom. I just, I just don't, I'm not down with that. So I'm like, God, if you ever bring that in front of me, it is because you want me to do something about it. <laughs> if I saw it, you want me to do something about it. We have this agreement. So I'm walking through the aisle there, and this boy is cussing at his mom in the freezer section because she won't buy him the thing he wants. I was like, oh no, I'm about to take my belt off. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't, even though I wanted to. I was like, they may come to church one day, and I don't want to say, that man beat me. So, <laughs> But I'm walking through there, and I hear him, man, you don't effing do anything for me. You don't do da, da, da. I'm like, just the fact that you talk back to your mom about not getting you something that you want when she's got a grocery full of food that's healthy for you. I walked over. I said, son, you know it's bad when somebody calls you son. <laughs> And I went, I went straight daddy at him. I said, son, like that. And the mom was like, oh no, what's gonna happen here? She didn't know what to do. I said, is that your mom right there? He said, yeah. I said, say yes, sir. He said, yes, sir. I said, are you cussing at your mom? He said, yeah. I said, don't, don't ever cuss at your mom again. I said, how old are you? He's like, I'm 14. I said, I lost my mom when I was 13. I said, you got one mom. And she's in here buying groceries for you. I said, you better respect her. I said, don't ever treat her like that, and don't think that people aren't going to notice and aren't going to say something, because I'm going to say something. I said, apologize to your mom. She says, sorry, sorry, mom. And she's sitting there like this. <laughs> I said, okay, so we're good. I said, ma'am, you have a nice day? I said, respect your mom, and walked away. And they were just silent. And I could tell as they walked away, they're like, uh, I hope we don't run into them in the next style. <laughs> But in that moment, I felt compelled to bring correction to a young man when he was disrespecting his, his mom. So there are times where the Lord may do that. Just make sure you're being led by the Spirit. But in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Lord says this. All scription, uh, scription, wow. <laughs> I just bind confusion around this pulpit right now. We got all kind of wrong words flowing out. What's going on here? In the name of y'all pray. Where are my intercessors at? What do y'all pray for this morning? Was there any prayer for me? Goodness. <laughs> all right, here we go. Slow it down. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is given by inspiration. That word inspiration comes from the word inspire. It's breath. That means God breathed. That means the spirit of God wrote every word that's in there and the word of God is good for correction. So the Holy Spirit, through mankind, wrote these words so that it could bring correction into someone's life. So a lot of times, when you, when you, when you talk to people and you have to bring correction, it's best just to give the word. Because guess what? If it's your opinion, it doesn't matter much. Because your opinion's not good for correction. It's the word of God that's good for correction. So, but the Holy Spirit will bring that to them. He'll, 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 he'll convict and be like, you shouldn't be doing that. Here's what you should be doing. I'll give you the strength to do it. And we gotta be patient with people. We gotta allow people to have time to make correction and change. You can't just expect somebody to change overnight. That's just not how it works. So he brings correction to people. So one, he convicts. Two, he corrects. Number three, character development. Are y'all getting the pattern here? These are all C's. You know I like that alliteration stuff. So character development. Titus chapter three, just a couple just a couple pages over in your Bible. Titus chapter 3. The Lord says this. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So he, he, he sets them up. He gives them a little background. Remember, you weren't so perfect. You know, one of the things that can be, that can be very... Uh, uh, difficult for people in the world to, to listen to a Christian is when we're, we're coming so hard at them and they're like, wait a minute, why are you coming so hard at me when six months ago we were in the club together? 
It's like, we were doing all that together. Now you're coming to me. He's like, remember where you were. Remember that you've made these mistakes too. Remember that you yourself aren't perfect, but for the grace of God, you'd be doing the same stuff. So let's, re let's remember that we've all have been and are continually disobedient and doing things that are wrong. And we're all in a process of development. And let's remember that the Holy Spirit is going to come in and develop our character, but it's development. It doesn't just happen overnight. It takes time, and we have to allow people to, to go through that process. I mean, look at the people in the Bible. They had some long processes. Abraham wasn't even ready to be spoken to by God until he was 75 years old. Let him have his process. So you've all been these things. It says, but when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared... Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He comes in and he begins to develop our character and wash and regenerate our hearts and minds. He washed my mind from cussing. It wasn't my, my parents telling me everything. They planted the seed of that's wrong. But he washed me. He cleansed me and said, you don't do that anymore. And I haven't since. And I, and I stay away from that. But he did the work. Everybody said, he does the work. He does the work. Number four, he brings comfort. John chapter 14. I know we're going all through the scriptures. Y'all got your Bibles? Yes. Let me see it. Hold it up. Good. Screens count. Screens count. All right, good. Remember, don't just take my word for it. It's not my word that'll help you. It's God's word. So make sure you got your Bibles and make sure you're reading and make sure you're checking up. It's okay to question the pastor and be like, now what do you mean by that? By the way, we're going to have a time for Q&A at the end, too. We're going to get back to that so you guys can text in your questions. Would you get that, that screen ready on there? It's like the 481 number. So you can test, text in your questions at the end. So John 14, 26. The Lord says, says this. Actually, let's, uh, let's back up to John uh, 14, 16. It says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Isn't that, isn't that nice? He's like, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to be here for you. It says, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, uh, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest, manifest myself to him. So he says, look, I'm not going to leave you an orphan. I'm going to send a helper, a comforter. That word there is parakletos. Everybody say parakletos. See, not so easy, huh? Parakletos. Parakletos means comforter, helper, aid, counsel, advocate is going to come to help you. And then in verse 26, now let's go there. It says, but the helper, comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I said to you. See, comfort comes in many different forms. See, he comes in as a comforter first just for your heart and your mind. He says, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm not going to leave you alone. He has emotional comfort. Have you ever gone through something so painful and so traumatic? A loss, a, a tragedy, a hurt, a pain, a brokenness? You need comfort. Hurt you can't describe requires a comfort you can't explain. And that's what the Holy Spirit brings. I remember those times of loss, those times of hurt, and those times of confusion. When my mom passed away, when uh, I, was, I was 13, it was at, a, it was at a, a very weird time. It was right after my parents' anniversary. It was right before uh, Ariel and I's birthdays. It was, it was just all this stuff, right in the, the end of my freshman year in high school, and just all these things, just like crazy. She's gone. And now 
there's 14 children without, without their mother. But don't you know, the Holy Spirit sent an unusual comfort to us. We hurt and we were in pain. But there was this unusual comfort. At her memorial service, people were looking at us like we were crazy. I remember us driving there, and we were all cracking up in the limousine. And people were looking at us like, oh, they're just crazy. <laughs> I was like, no, it's just crazy comfort. The Lord brought this peace, and our family, who had suffered a devastating loss, was the one bringing comfort to everyone around us. It was, it was an unusual peace and comfort and grace that God had given us during that time. Undescribable pain requires an indescribable comfort. He brings comfort. He comforts us through helping us and giving us instruction. I'll tell you, I was, I was working a job yesterday, and I was getting so frustrated. I was like, Lord, now look, you want me to be a good witness, right? I'm in these people's house fixing things, and this thing is just not lining up here. I was like, so I got to keep my cool, so you need to help me in this. And I got up, turned around like this, and all of a sudden, bing, God was like, okay, I was just waiting for you to ask. You were trying to do it yourself, and you should have just asked from the beginning. And man, five minutes. I've been working on this thing for an hour, and in five minutes after I asked God, he came in and gave me the help and just showed me what to do. I'm like, what am I going to learn, Lord? He's like, I know, I know, I got you, though. He brings help. He brings aid. He's the counselor as well. That's uh, another thing that uh, comforter means. It means counsel. You know that God wants to be your personal counselor? Now, we have, we have people that give us counsel in this time, and we know what the scripture says, that with a multitude of counselors, there is safety. That is true, and we should have counsel. We have wise counsel here. However, God wants to counsel you personally. He wants to tell you how to navigate through this thing in your life. This difficulty, he wants to talk to you. And you know what? I, I bet you, if you think back, you remember that he has talked to you. You, you ever gone through those moments where you're going through a difficult situation and you kind of get this compelling like feeling like you need to do something and then you're like, nah, that ain't right. That's, nah, that's not true. And then you go back and you carry on and it turns out that's exactly what you needed to do. I do that every day. <laughs> every day I'm like, oh, I should, do, I should do this. Case in point, yesterday we have some of the, uh, the, the men come over, uh, uh, a discipleship group that we have here, and I'm making breakfast for them. And we have this gigantic pan that somebody left at our house. Whenever somebody comes over to our house, we get new dishes. It's awesome. Y'all yeah. need to come back and get them. So we got this gigantic pan, and I'm making this, what we call crack bacon on it. And it's, it, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, sorry, Kurt. So we, I was making this, and I'm laying out the bacon, and it's early in the morning, and I'm dragging and everything, and I'm basting it with the honey and the, and the brown sugar and all this stuff. I know your mouth is watering now, isn't it? <laughs> so I'm getting everything ready, and while I'm getting it ready, I get this feeling. It's like, you need to test and see if that's big enough for the oven. I was like, well, I've already got like a whole pound laid out on this. I'm like, nah, I don't need to do that. I'm good. Turn around, put it, put it in the... Pum, pum. It's like that much too big. And God's like, I was like, I know, I know. So I had to pull it out, redo everything. It's just little things. Anybody, am I alone? Please don't look at me like I'm crazy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Help a brother out up here. But he's our counselor. He's teaching you. He's telling you how to interact with people, how to do your jobs. You know the first time that the Holy Spirit was given in the Bible where it literally says he filled them with the Spirit of God was so that he could do work? so that they could do the work of building the tabernacle. He taught him how to, how to mold gold and bronze and do all the tapestries and everything. That was the first time God poured out the Holy Spirit in someone so they could do work. So even in your little stuff, don't keep God separate from any area of your life as if God's just worried about this part, but he's not worried about this part. Hey, you know what? God, I need help changing a tire. I can do that. Lord, I don't know what's going on with this computer. Guess what? He knows that too. It's not like God's stuck back in the ancient. Do you ever have this picture of God in your mind like he's stuck back in the Old Testament and he doesn't, doesn't get our modern technology? <laughs> like, oh yeah, he's got dominion over our bodies, but my cell phone, forget about it. He can't do that. I mean, I need the nerd down at the station down there to work on that. No, he's got it all worked out. He's got it all figured out. Don't separate him from any area of your life. He knows how it works and he's better than you and better than anyone else. He created that. So take it to him. Let him be your counselor in all things. So number four, he is our comfort. Number five, he is our counselor. Number six, he is the compeller. He compels you. Ooh, this, this is when things start getting real deep with God, when he starts compelling you to do things. Oh, man. Now, now when you get to this point, 
And there's deep, that, that deep compelling, that means that there's also going to be a deep conviction when you resist it. Oh, man. Turn to, turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Just a short verse here. Listen what, what it says here. This is Paul in his travels. And he's writing this and he says, And see, now I go bound. Another word for that is, I, I now am compelled in the spirit to go to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that the chains, uh, that chains and tribulations await me. So Paul is saying, I'm compelled to go to Jerusalem. I can't help it. The Holy Spirit is pushing me and moving me, and I have to do this. You guys ever had that feeling? Yeah. This is where it usually shows up with me. I'm walking down the street, and God's like, you should talk to that person right there. And I'm like, that one right there? The one right back there? You, you're talking about that one over there? Right now? Knowing where it's going to be? And you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, you keep going, and then you're like, oh, Okay. Or you completely ignore it. And then you walk away and you're like, man. And it just hit, the conviction hits you and you're like, I should have said something. Gosh, why didn't I say something? And God's like, I'm not surprised. I knew you weren't going to do it. I had somebody else lined up. I just wanted you to feel this. <laughs> I wanted you to feel what it feels like to ignore when I talk to you so the next time you'll actually do it. I had somebody lined up behind them that was actually going to talk to him. I'm God. You don't catch me off guard. He's like, dang it, you ruined my plans. No, he knows. But he compels you to do things. He moves you to do things. And it's kind of like, ah, you have to. But man, when you start just going with the flow, and God just starts, oh, I need to go over here. Man, he'll do the silliest things. He'll, he'll tell you the directions. I've been in the car. I was driving to pick somebody up one day because I was taking them to an event that they were going to. And I was like, man, my phone died. I'm like, I have no idea how to get there. I'm like, Lord, I'm just going to drive. I, I, I had seen the house. I'd seen a picture of the house. And I'm driving. I'm like, well, I'm just going to drive here. I'm just going to drive here. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I should turn here. The house is right there. I am not lying. I'm like, oh, my God, it works. <laughs> God is my personal GPS. <laughs> I was literally, dry, I, I exited the 118, made a left. I knew I was in the general neighborhood. I was like, I'm just going to drive. Went straight. I was like, I should make a right here. I should make a left here. I'll make a right here. And I ended up right at the dude's house. It was like one of those things that's so amazing. Nobody's going to believe you. So you just like, ah, but now I'm telling all you guys. You believe me, right? Yes. But man, he, he, he compels you. He moves you. And then he directs you. And then you get to experience the amazing joy that comes from knowing that you have just heard the voice of God and it was confirmed. Because that's one of the biggest things as Christians is like, I just want to hear the voice of God. I just want to know that he's talking to me. When you step out in faith and he confirms it, then you're like, yes, I did hear from you. And it's so encouraging because you know you heard from God. And that means you know you can do it again. You know you can hear his voice again. And you just begin to be led by the Spirit. Led by the Spirit. So he is the one that compels us as well. Seven, he communicates he helps communicate through us. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Now, when I say communicate, I mean communicate to the Father. He does help us and give us instruction on how to communicate with one another. He'll give us wisdom and be like, don't say that to this person. This is not the time to press that button. Just, shh. Husbands, wives, can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah, when you, when you ignore that one, you get a little bit more of the conviction that comes back at you, huh? You better be able to listen. But communication specifically to the Father. He teaches us how to pray. Look at Romans 8, verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So he says, look, even when you don't know how to pray, you ever tried to do, you know, you, you're on your routine, and you get done praying, and you're like, I just pray for everything in like five minutes. Now what? You ever been there? The Spirit teaches you what to pray. He'll bring people to, to remembrance. 
He'll, he'll bring up situations and circumstances that need prayer because God wants to be in agreement with the prayers of his saints in order to bring his will down to earth. So he will teach you what to pray. He will show you how to communicate with God. One of the things that we pray when we get together in our, in our staff meetings is, Lord, take control and show us how to pray today. Teach us what our minds and our hearts should be focused on today so we can pray in agreement with you. So he helps us to communicate with the Father. And this last one, and this one is extremely important. Romans 8, 16. Just look over just a few verses. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Amen. Number eight is, he confirms. The Holy Spirit is the confirmation that you belong to him. Amen. If we're honest, I bet you you've gone through a time in your life where you're like, God, am I even saved? I mean, do I really know you? Do I, do I know you? Man, when you got the Holy Spirit walking working in your life you know yeah. you know you're like undoubtedly no I'm a child of God I feel the conviction like my, my like my dad standing right in front of my face telling me son you know you're not supposed to do that I know that I feel his compelling like he's right there with me with his arms around me almost pulling me in this direction I know I'm his his the Holy Spirit bears witness with yours that you are a child of God an heir of his. There's a confidence that you have when you know that you're a child of God that erases worry and doubt and anxiety. You know you belong to him. There's a confidence that you have when you walk into that job interview because you know, you know what? I got this. And even if I don't, God's got something better for me. You don't worry about it. When you walk into that place and you're, and you're trying to get that bid for that job, when you, when you walk down the street or you're going into court or you're going into all these things, there's a confidence that you have because the spirit is bearing witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. If you're a child of God, he's got your back. He'll pay your bills. He'll take care of that situation. He'll oversee that person. He'll watch over your children when you can't see them. I'm like, man, we've got all these devices to track our children all over the place. You know who's tracking my children is the Holy Spirit. Now, it doesn't mean we don't take precautions and everything, but I don't worry about that because I know that he has them. I have that confidence. Why? Because I'm his child, and if I'm his child, I'm his responsibility. And he takes care of his responsibilities. He is not an absentee father. He is there for his children. And I know that. So I don't worry. I don't fret. God is in control. And there's a peace that comes from, the, from that knowing that you're his child. That confidence. And you need to have that. And you can have it. You can have that confidence. You just need to receive the Spirit. You need to have the Holy Spirit moving in your life. And it's not some weird spiritual thing. We're going to get into all the weird stuff or what people think is weird or how people have made things weird starting next week. We're going to talk about the gifts of God. We're going to talk about, well, is praying in, in tongues? Is that, is that right or is that wrong? Is that weird? Is that for today? Is it not? Does the Holy Spirit give gifts today still? You've got this whole sect of people that think that the Holy Spirit like, just dropped the bomb real quick and then it was out and left. It just kind of left us here to kind of fend for ourselves. Is that true? or What's, what's really true? We're going to get into all the controversies. You guys know I have no problem with that. So we're going to answer all those questions. But it's one thing for me to tell you, but when you have the Spirit, He brings conviction Himself. He does all these things. He'll convict, He'll correct, He'll teach, He'll counsel. He'll tell you all those things. So you need to have Him. Do you have the Spirit of God working in you? Do you feel His conviction? Do you feel him gently correcting you? Do you feel his comfort? Do you feel the compelling of the spirit? Have you felt his counsel? Have you felt him communicating through you to the Father? And do you feel confident that you are confirmed as his child? If the answer to any of those is no, let me tell you, there's a new level that the Lord wants you to, to rise uh, to. There's a new experience that you have. It's not all about what you understand in your head. It's about what you know in your heart. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. It brings it from that intellectual place to that knowing and that confidence. See, if I can talk you into this, someone can talk you out. That's the intellectual stuff. And God is logical. But there is a knowing that comes from experiencing him. And that only happens through the Holy Spirit. 
That's the only way it happens. Otherwise, otherwise you're kind of like, well, I feel good. Oh, yeah, some days you feel good like a Christian, and some days you're like, oh. Okay, now, I've, oh, I don't know about this Christian thing. It's not really working for me. Oh, well, no, no, I'm good. That's intellectual. But when the Spirit comes in, you're going to have your down days. Make no mistake. I'll be honest with y'all. You know, some Sundays, I just don't want to get out of bed. I got, I'm like, Lord, I am so tired, and I got to go preach, and I don't know if they're going to listen to me. I don't know if I got anything funny to say. I might be dry and just boring. I don't know what's going to happen, but you know what? I'm going to go. You will have days like that. You're like, did you have that this morning? That sounds kind of fresh. You know? <laughs> no, I was feeling good this morning, even though I did have a late night. I was feeling good this morning. I'm fresh and ready to go. But when you're a Christian, you are going to have moments and times like that. And that's okay. That's a part of our experience. You're not going to know that you need a comforter. Unless you're in an uncomfortable situation, like Pastor Jared said last week. A lot of times you don't feel the comfort of the Holy Spirit because you don't get out of your comfort zone. God wants you to get out of your comfort zone so then you actually need him. Amen. You've never experienced a helper because you don't need any help. You're only doing the things that you know you can do. God wants you to step outside the box and do some things that you can't do on your own. As a matter of fact, that's where he is. That's exactly where he is in, in the I can't do this alone area of your life. That's where he wants you to venture. But if you don't know that you're his child, you'll hesitate to do it because you don't have the confidence that he'll be with you. So come and get the confidence that he'll be with you. Well, preacher man, how do I do that? One, you've got to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That means that you need to repent. It, repentance means that there is an acknowledgement that the direction that I'm going in, the mindset that I have, is not what's going to lead me towards my ultimate purpose in life. It is not the right path. And the Holy Spirit convicts you of that and lets you know that. So when you repent, you say, you know what? I hear you, God. I acknowledge this isn't the way I'm supposed to be going. Nothing wrong against you guys. This, you guys are great guys. This is not the bad path. I'm just pointing over here. I need to go this way towards you. That's repentance, a change of mind. My way is not going to get me to fulfillment. Your way is. That's repentance and acknowledging that. And then you need to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. And it's Lord and Savior. That means that you're going to trust him with your life. That not only will he forgive you of all your sins and wash you clean, and I mean every sin. There's not one sin that is so bad that God's like, oh, I didn't prepare for that one. He prepared for all of them. He's got every sin taken care of. He will wash you clean and forgive you of everything. And you don't have to worry about standing before him. You don't have to have guilt or shame in your life. He's washed you clean. And then you submit to his lordship, which means this. God, I trust that what you tell me to do is better than what I think I should do. That's submitting to his lordship. Yeah, right. Then once you do that, then he says, good. He washes you, cleans you, and then fills you with his Holy Spirit. <laughs>